7 o'clock, uh, start the select board meeting for January 11th, 2021. Um, first order of business is to approve the agenda unless there's any changes. Um, it's with the that, hour. Can I get a motion to approve the agenda? Make a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Second. Great. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Second item, uh, consent agenda items, minutes of the January 4th meeting and the liquor license for craft beer seller. Can I get a motion? Make a motion to approve the consent agenda items as presented. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 General public, anyone to discuss anything before we get into the regular agenda items? Yes, Mark. Uh, Skip Flanders here, and I have one item I'd like to talk to the board about. Sure. Go ahead, Skip. Um. This is, uh, we all um, know that um, one of the Waterbury's longtime residents, Everett uh, Coffee, passed away in uh, December 19th. And he was a uh, longtime resident and a faithful, uh, you know, participation in community activities, uh, and government affairs, very interested in public safety and. Uh, a long time um, member on the trustees and in talking with Bill and things, we felt that it was uh, the community should do something in expressing our sympathy to his family and things for Everett's uh, you know, participation in the community. Last year, we gave him the Wallace Award and um, with Bill's help here, I've put together a resolution of sympathy um, and I'm gonna try my second attempt at stream share here and put this um, resolution of sympathy that I put together up on the screen. Um, does everyone see it? Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. Sir. And, um, what I thought, uh, see if the select board was interested in uh, passing this resolution of sympathy and Mark would uh, sign it. And then when we have our um, Edward Farrar utility district meeting Wednesday, we would take it up as well and I would sign it. And uh, Carla would apply the town seal and um, Mark and I would uh, contact the family and maybe uh, present it to them out in the parking lot or something, um, uh, expressing our um, sympathy. I don't know. Can most of you read it on the screen or? Yeah, Skip. Why don't you Why don't you read it? There might be some people that are just phoning in that can't see it. Okay. Um, resolution of sympathy. The community of Waterbury was deeply saddened by the death of Everett W. Coffey on Saturday, December 19th, 2020. And whereas Everett made his home in Waterbury since October, 1962. And whereas Everett became an active community member working with fellow citizens in all aspects for the betterment of community life. And whereas Everett spent a major part of his life dedicated to assisting and protecting the public safety, health, and welfare of his fellow citizens. And whereas Everett served as fellow citizens in numerous capacities over his lifetime, holding numerous elected and appointed positions in local and state government. Whereas Everett was presented with a 2019 Wallace Community Service Award by the citizens of Waterbury in recognition and appreciation for his lifetime of service for the betterment of his community and assistance of his fellow residents. Whereas his passing will be sorely, sorely felt by his wife, Annie, family members, and his many friends and the entire community. 
Now, ther therefore, be it resolved by the Town of Waterbury Select Board and the Edward Farrar Utility District Commissioners that we hereby express our sincere sympathy to his family, including his wife, Annie, sons, Donald and David, daughters, Sally and Mary Ellen, grandchildren and great grandchildren. Be it further resolved that this resolution be spread upon the permanent records of the town of Waterbury and a copy of this resolution be presented to his family as a token of our sympathy. Mark W. Fryer and T. Howard Flanders. So, um, Bill um, helped me edit that and uh, put it together. And um, when I was elected a water commissioner in 1988, um, my uh, mother had passed away in uh, December of that year. And Everett uh, was on the... Uh, trustees at that time and did a resolution of sympathy for uh, for me for that. So um, we'd like the select board to consider it and um, we're not, so. Yeah, yeah, Skip, thank you for putting this together and Bill as well. Um, I think it's great and I would be in support of this and I also thank Everett for everything he's done for the town and the time he spent in public service. I'm, I make a, 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 resolu a motion to approve the resolution of sympathy. I'll second that. Second. Great. Um, the motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 We'll miss Everett. Yes, um, so I'll um, drop it off with uh, Carla in the office and you can stop in and sign it sometime, Mark, or how do you want to do that? Yep. Yeah, I can stop in this week. Okay. We'll have it uh, there for Carla tomorrow and we can apply the seal and when it's signed, we'll um, contact the family there. So thank you, folks. Yeah, thank you. All right. Any additional discussion for the from the public? All right. Uh, we will move on to the Waterbury Area Senior Center. Uh, you want to say something? I was just going to say thank you very much uh, for the resolution, and uh, we appreciate the, the condolences we've received from from the community, and uh, I'm glad that everyone has appreciated the the public service of both my father and my mother. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Waterbury Area Senior Center discussion. Okay, um, so Justin Blackman is here. Justin is, I think, the president of the Waterbury Area Senior Center. Um, the Senior Center is um, a long time uh, recipient of town uh, funding. Um, and it's been a number of years since the, uh, anyone from the senior center has actually come to a select board meeting to talk about their mission and what they're trying to accomplish. Obviously with uh, COVID-19, things changed everywhere, including the senior center uh, back last spring. And they're continuing to uh, operate. So uh, there's been a little bit of um, <clears throat> chatter in the community about what's going on with the senior center. And I received several emails and a couple of telephone calls back in the September, October timeframe. I met with a couple of their board members before the new members had been elected. So that was before Justin was elected. Um, they shared with me the financial statement that I sent out to the board uh, over the weekend. But I thought it would be helpful. Um, I'm assuming the senior center is asking for an appropriation this year. Uh, and I just thought it would be helpful to uh, invite Justin to come in and speak to us and answer any questions. Uh, I didn't read it, but evidently there was a, an article in the weekend, uh, Waterbury Roundabout. So, um, I guess this is kind of like I wasn't aware that was happening until 
just the other day and Justin was ready to go uh, a couple of weeks ago. So thank you, Justin, and why don't you take it from there? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come and talk to you guys this evening. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay, and hopefully you can see my shared screen at the moment. Is that um, an affirmative? Okay. Yep. Thank you very much. So a very quick something about myself. Um, I am Justin Blackman, 17 years in the area, two, first two of those living in Waterbury, 15 of those after that in Duxbury. You might know me from scooping ice cream at one of the concerts in the park, or possibly on the 4th of July, uh, leading a troop of lawn tractors. Um, yes, I have a British accent, but don't worry, I've been a citizen for almost two years. I've been on the board of the Senior Centre since October of last year, and I was very soon voted in as chairman or chairperson in November of last year. Um, so also on the call this evening, representing the Senior Centre, uh, we have uh, Roger Tubby, who is our treasurer, and Ron Galias, who is our latest board member and is our vice chair. So uh, let's get right into a quick mission statement for you. Um, I'll break this down. I have already highlighted what I believe is the most important line here. To enrich the lives of older persons. Um, so some people will think the senior center is just delivering food to our seniors. They'll just think that's what we do. Um, but there's so much more than just delivering the food. Um, for some of our recipients, that delivery person might be the only human contact that person is getting that day. And that very brief welfare visit, as we call them, um, is so important and especially so during these COVID times. Um, so with the current restrictions in place, we are not able to offer our normal congregate meals, host bingo nights, or have movie nights, anything like that. We are restricted from that at the moment, but nevertheless, um, we are kept busy. There are calls to the center every single day with some kind of question from our members in the, in the community. Some of those we can answer ourselves. Some of those we can refer to other agencies, but rest assured, um, the folks at the senior center are being kept busy every day, trying to complete that mission statement of enriching the lives of our older persons. Um, just as a very quick side note, I hope everybody knows that the senior center has a fantastic selection of medical aids. If anyone needs a short term wheelchair or anything like that, talk to the folks at the senior center. Uh, in the basement, we've got a fantastic selection of whatever you need, crutches, wheelchairs, anything like that. So let's take a little look. I know everyone's always interested at a little look at some financials. I know you have a copy in front of you. Um, on the first page of those, um, I've highlighted uh, a few areas of, of particular interest. So we have um, <clears throat> so we finished last year basically on par um, with a few notable um, lines on the budget to look at. So the first one we can look at, we are dramatically down on, our, on donations we have been receiving. Um, and I think some of that is just a sign of the times. Um, for all sorts of reasons, it is a very difficult place at the moment to be fundraising for, especially when we are unable to use our space to host events that we would be fundraising from. Um, so as a second point, um, you will notice we also received 
some, what I will call some windfall money, some extra money from the CVCOA. Um, so uh, that extra money from the CVCOA, and those are the folks who provide a way of getting federal money for Meals on Wheels to help fund us. Um, Justin, Justin, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes. Did you say that did you say that donations were down? This is saying they're up by 150 percent. This is uh, your actual. Your budget is 67.5. You received 101.928, which is 34.428 over budget, not under budget. Are from from the, the 151 received on the uh, which line were you? So if you look at if you look at income at the very top of the page, it says yes. catering, and then it says, okay, yes. is donations this line or the which line is donations? All of these down here, I guess. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. I, I am. I I apologize for interrupting. I thought no. that said. The, the screen is a little bit um, the, I think, is a little blurry, so it's I thought um, it said donations. So I, I apologize if for if the screen is isn't as good on your paper copy. Yes, yeah, so um, you were right. You were right. So, so just proceed the way that you were. I apologize. Okay. Okay. So we we were lucky to have some extra monies from the CVCOA. Um, that is for uh, partially for two reasons. One is because we have provided more Meals on Wheels than was on our original contract to do so with the CVCOA. And the CVCOA have also provided extra funds because they realize it is harder to provide the Meals on Wheels. As an example, um, in the last few years, the senior center had worked to provide uh, special reusable trays that the food was provided on that could then um, come back and be cleaned and reused. And that was all good for trying to be recycling friendly. But now all of a sudden, we're not allowed to do that. So we have to use more uh, re recyclable and disposable containers. So. We have received some extra monies through those federal channels to help us do that. Uh, and that's where the extra monies come from. Um, so we'll move on to the second page uh, on, the, on the financials. So there's a few things uh, to look at here. Um, many of these administrative costs are things that are more constant, even in a time of, of COVID. Um, so um, our administration costs were able to be kept under control and our payroll came in very, very close to budget. Um, I would also point out that um, we have a very good result in cost saving for our foods. Um, and our kitchen manager, Kim, has done great work in coming 15% um, lower than we've had for food costs in the past. Uh, so that's uh, a, a really, a really grand work there. We also see just of, of interest, uh, the mileage costs that, um, that we are used to reimbursing our volunteer drivers uh, is much lower than, than we thought. And you'd, you'd wonder why that is when I've mentioned we are delivering more, more meals, <laughs> are we somehow doing less miles? But not at all. It's actually our fabulous volunteer drivers who very often will choose not to put in a financial claim for their miles. So they are not only donating their time, they're also putting their own gas money in, into this endeavor. So. No, those are some really amazing volunteers we have out there. Um, let's move on to the third page, the short summary from that year. Um, we end up 
coming in with uh, in the black for around about seventeen thousand dollars, a little under seventeen. Okay. So moving on to the next page, we'll have a little look at where we stand with a balance sheet. Um, so I'm certainly no accountant, but um, I know enough to look for the big numbers and for the line uh, for the section totals. Um, so we're showing 23,000 in the bank. Um, we're still expecting uh, 20,000 in from various towns that uh, are expected and uh, promised amounts. And that ends up giving us a total of around about 45,000 um, as assets. We'll take a look at where we stand for liabilities. So hopefully on that fifth page there, uh, again, we're looking out for the big numbers, and I'm sure people will have noticed there is a 40,000 um, uh, appearing under a line saying arrears, payroll tax. And that relates to a period of time when a payroll tax form had not been filed correctly. And we have contracted with an outside accounts firm who has helped us to get everything up to date uh, and everything filed correctly. Uh, and we currently have filed an abatement form with the IRS in a hope of getting the interest and penalties written off for that. Um, so uh, I know that that's uh, one area that people have uh, had some questions about in the past. So let's move on from there. I'm sorry, I know we don't have too much time this evening, just trying to cover everything. So to look at a little bit of data, um, I can tell you that pre-pandemic, uh, we were serving 55 recipients normally, and we are now up to 66 recipients. And my basic math is telling me that's a 20% increase um, and there's a brief breakdown of how many recipients from each town and just a percentage of uh, what percentage of our recipients come from each town so we see that yes Waterbury um, does have uh, an overwhelming uh, monopoly on the number of uh, Meals on Wheels recipients and we'd expect that being right there on our doorstep. So we end up with a whopping 17,628 meals per year. Um, now, I certainly think that's uh, quite a feat uh, for two people to put out of the senior center kitchen. Um, I think that's quite a, quite a big number. So let's take a little look at the breakdown from that. So um, the, uh, to break that down, 17,628 meals with an overall running cost for everything senior center, 225,000 gives us a cost per meal, $12.76. And that is absolutely everything. That's um, paying the rent, light, heat, absolutely everything included in that cost. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned CVCOA and their contract. Um, so we receive from the, from the federal government $3.76 per meal. And we have a certain number of meals that we are contracted uh, to provide. Um, the CVCOA, as well as funneling federal monies to us, they also provide excellent support. Um, uh, they get involved in the menus which we set. For instance, um, ev every month we will put together a suggested menu, send it to the CVCOA, and 
they have uh, uh, trained dietitians check over our menu and make sure that what we are proposing uh, meets all of their recommendations for the amount of sugar, the amount of salt, can't have too much carbohydrates, only allowed, I can't remember, but three ounces of protein. So we are kept in check um, by the folks at the CBCOA. But the result of that leaves us with looking to try and raise monies to cover $9 for each one of those meals. Okay, we'll move on from there. So a brief rundown of where we try and get our funding from. So we have an annual fundraising letter that hopefully everybody got last week. Hopefully some nods, everybody saw that. Hopefully everybody uh, uh, wrote a big check and put it in an envelope for us as well. Um, so we also um, have donations from our Meals on Wheels recipients. Um, I, I don't need to read all of these out for you, but we can see, um, I think I actually move on to the next one. I've highlighted two areas in particular that are going to be very tough for us to uh, manage this year. So normally we are able to rent out the space, for instance, parties or uh, uh, some business meetings, including the Rotary Club, who would traditionally meet in the space. Um, there is also, uh, many people know, if, uh, if there's a funeral or a party, that the Senior Centre is a great place to go uh, to have catering provided for that event. And all of that comes under uh, this $32,000. And that is something that in the current um, COVID situation, we are not able to, to do. So we are not really expecting anything from that line item. Um, we would no normally also offer a congregate meal several times a week. And that would normally bring in a $5,000 in donations uh, from people enjoying that meal. And again, we can't provide that meal. We can't use the space at the moment. So we, we end up, our bottom line is potentially, we are looking at a $37,500 in monies that we at the moment don't quite expect is going to come in. Okay, so what are we doing about that? Well, internally, the Senior Centre Board has set up a new committee, a fundraising committee. Um, that committee is made up of four members from the community. Uh, some people may have seen on Front Porch Forum recently, I put out a request for people. And yes, we got a good response, four people from the community and also four people from the Senior Centre Board and Management are, uh, are joining that committee. We are actively looking at these four ideas right now um, and not exactly sure how much we'll be able to, to raise from an online auction, a sponsored walk slash run, we'll see how that goes, road rally and a 50-50 raffle but maybe 20,000, maybe. It's, a, it's tough out there at the moment for anyone nonprofit fundraising. So let's have a look at where our towns come into, into this question of helping to fund the senior center. Um, we looked at the number of recipi recipients, 66. Um, we looked at, um, uh, and I can show you the numbers here for what our, all of our towns are donating right now. Um, we can see that, um, what, what can we see here? That we're seeing Bolton and, yeah, we're, we're seeing that, uh, yeah, so we're seeing Middlesex coming in well over uh, their percentage of people. We're seeing Bolton and Moortown 
basically on par, and Duxbury and Waterbury a little bit below par. Um, is that that's a golfing term, so we'll call it a bogey, shall we? Um, so if we look forward a little bit and see what would happen if we tried to get some of those numbers to match the percentage of recipients, um, we would be looking for increases potentially from a few of the towns and we will be, well, we are actively in the process of sharing exactly this data and these numbers we've seen today with all of the towns and looking to see if there is any way uh, that some small increases might be able to be made. Um, so in conclusion, I see, it, I see we're up there on time. Um, 2021, it's not gonna be easy for anyone. Our staff will keep on working very hard to enrich the lives of the older persons. Our volunteers in the same way are, are going to continue working hard, giving up their time and their gas money. Our fundraising committee is gonna see if we can get all of these four events uh, to happen and see if we can get near that $20,000 um chunk of change to help us um the board at the senior center is also going to do whatever it can to continue looking after after the uh, financial oversight and well-being of the center and also to provide guidance for our members of staff there as well and most importantly with support from our communities towns uh, we will continue to thrive as a senior centre. So with that, I don't know how much time you've got for questions, but willing to answer whatever I can. Hi, um, Katie here. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I did read that article in the recent Waterbury Reader, um, and I found out some things I had never known. I, I technically, I haven't been down to the Senior Center, um, so this is very informational for me. Um, kind of an awkward question, but a question I do have nonetheless. Does it seem like there's a lot of turnover in the, in the um, Senior Center, like staffing-wise to you? That's just a general question I have. Uh, there has been some turnover after what was a very stable time. Um, people are very fond of talking back of, uh, of a time when Carol Smith uh, was director and Gail uh, Badeau was, was in the kitchen and people did like the stability of those two working together. Um, but times do change and personnel does have to change. Um, and no, we, we at the moment are very happy that we have a, uh, uh, a kitchen manager and cook who is very competent. Um, and again, uh, in, our, in our director uh, with, uh, with Vicky, again, uh, we have someone that knows what they're doing and is very hard working. Thank you, and thank you for all that you do down there. I, I haven't had a chance to do much yet. I've only been doing the job a short time. <laughs> I apologize, my, uh, I was running off my cell phone and it died, so now I'm on my terrible internet. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, COVID's made it very difficult for a lot of businesses to figure out how to fund themselves. So um, I feel for you guys um, trying to figure out, and I know you're trying to make any efforts to figure out how to, just like any of us to cover expenses, to try to figure out how to, to get through this. Um, personally, I, I'm in support of this. The ask for additional funds, is that, do you, do you see that as a ongoing request or is that more of a 2021 get us through and then we can revisit. 
Um, I, I don't see our, our costs uh, particularly changing. I would hope that in future years, when we don't have COVID restrictions on using our space, um, we wouldn't feel in quite so much of a pinch. Um, but um, in light of the, I think the, in, in what we were looking at here in potential help, um, it, it would be nice if we could uh, look towards trying to year on year to match the changing percentage of recipients to somehow fit in with the donation request. Uh, it might happen that in future years, the Waterbury numbers of recipients are lower. And, and likewise, it, it would follow that we quite possibly wouldn't be asking for, for quite as much. Okay. Um, any other select board members have any questions? And then um, I guess I turn to Bill to ask about his thoughts on any concerns he has on the additional budget and um, what we need to do to change it for the upcoming vote. This, this is Mike. I, I have a bunch of questions. Um, one, first of all, I do appreciate what the um, Senior Center does and I think your mission is noble, but I am concerned with uh, some of the financials and what's happening with financial management. And I'll ask a few direct questions account receivables of $20,000 per organization this size seems to be a lot. Uh, Justin, why is why is the account receivable so high? Okay, um, I am I am not an accountant. Uh, I, I don't know the answer uh, for that. I would be happy to look into that and come back to you guys with a, a written answer. Okay. I, I would have to do a little bit of checking myself. Following up on that, and you know, that goes in terms of you know the mistake with the payroll taxes. What kind of financial expertise does um, staff and or board members have? I'm I'm a, I'm quite not a little concerned. I'm quite concerned about that. Okay. Um, we we don't have uh, board members who would call themselves. CPAs or accountants or anything like that. If you know anyone that would like to join, please, uh, please, please come talk to us. We would, we'd love to, to have some added assistance there. Um, what, what we have done to try and mitigate um, uh, any, any problems and any future uh, uh, problems, we have contracted with an outside um, uh, firm to help us do that and they help us um, reconcile and they help us every month they, they help to make sure we have things um, properly on the books and they also help us with our filing of any, any IRS and tax related issues as well. So, so you don't, I assume by that statement, you're not getting an audit of your organization. Um, I believe the answer is we, we do not have an audit um, done uh, uh, by an outside firm to come and check us there. I believe I'm right in saying that that is because we are um, under the uh, under the limits that that would require that to be done and it has a very big price tag normally involved in having an outside audit done what is your um executive director's financial experience is, is it more geared to like the food service side or does she have any significant um financial background for for you know Running an organization is complex. I know my wife's involved in food service, but you know her financial background's not not huge. And I think you know the executive director has to have a pretty good handle on the numbers. And it, uh, I'm just con I'm being honest. I'm just concerned about where the organization is going number wise. Sure. 
Um, from my understanding, uh, our executive uh, director, Vicky Brooker, does, does not have a, a financial qualification uh, background. Um, again, I, I revert back to um, what, what the board has instigated to help us through this time is contracting with this outside company to, uh, to make sure everything is being done right. Right. That's where I guess I'm a little bit concerned, and I, I don't know if um, Bill's going to go in that direction, are the amount of assistance, as much as I truly do believe in what your mission is, but the amount of requests has escalated over a number of years, and I guess I get concerned over the viability of the senior center without some you know, strong, strong financial leadership, which I, I guess I'm seeing a little bit of a question of. Okay, uh, I, I understand your, your thoughts there. Um, again, at, at the moment, I, I cannot answer that any more than we're yeah. doing what we can at the moment with the people we have. Yeah, so, um, so Justin, I appreciate your comments about the audit and, and they are absolutely expensive. <clears throat> and if you <clears throat> haven't hit that threshold, maybe that's reason enough. I think the fact that you have a, <clears throat> uh, an accounting firm helping with your I-9 or whatever they are, the, you know, the, the not-for-profit filings that have to be done. Some days at least looking a little bit at your books. Um, an audit would be a great thing. And I think once in a while, you know, maybe you should budget it. You don't have to do it every year, but I do think that, you know, one time kind of ponying it up for that, ponying up for that expense is, is probably worth it. You learn uh, quite a bit from an audit. And that might be helpful. But going back to uh, Mark's question and, and, and Justin's, so the, um, as I told you at the beginning, I, I got some emails back in the early fall about what was going on at the senior center. And the expression was, you know, we're paying the senior center $30,000 a year, and there ought to be some accountability, which I think we all agree with. But I did a little research. And I couldn't remember, but um, I went back when I responded to that person who wrote me and um, did a little, re a little research and found out that in 1999, we moved from $5,000 appropriation to 10. And it, it stayed uh, $10,000 from 1999 to 2007. And then in 2007, it went to $30,000. So it's been 14 or 15 years, no, 14 years uh, at $30,000. So there's not much else out there that the expense to the town hasn't increased in, in uh, a 14 year period. So this 32,500 is a modest increase. I'm not necessarily saying that, oh, who cares, let's just give it to them. Um, but this year, because we're going to, um, to put everything on special articles uh, on, on the warning, the senior citizens budget right now, uh, we fund in two different ways. We have a $10,000 general appropriation because back in 2007, when we went from 10,000 to 30,000, Somebody like Justin back 14 years ago came in and said, you know, this is a one-time deal. We just need this extra $20,000 once. Never went away. But we put $10,000 in the budget and then we have a $20,000 um, special article. Uh, so it's really up to the board. You can continue with the $10,000 budget and ask for a uh, $22,500 uh, special article. You can put, you know, twelve five in the budget and ask for a twenty thousand dollars special article. The real question is, are you willing to 
have a budget put together between an appropriation and a special article where it's 32.5 as opposed to 30. And that's really the decision we need to make tonight or before uh, January 28th. Um, do the board members have an opinion on uh, their thoughts on the request and how they might want to consider forming it? I'm very much looking at as much as, as, as I said, I'm so supportive of the mission of the senior center, but during COVID, a lot of businesses have been affected. Can there not be some cost savings and, and belt tightening measures? You know, I'm really not that much in favor of increasing the appropriation. As a matter of fact, I think there's some ways that you know, you can't keep on looking at the taxpayers to fund this mission. Uh, and I think as Bill said, you know, it's been kind of, you know, we've propped up the senior center for quite some time. You know, you, I know this is a tough year, but maybe there's gonna have to be some cost reductions in certain areas. You know, can can you not, you know, I, I, I wish you well, I hope you have some good create a fundraising that you can do in this year of COVID. I know I'm involved with a number of, uh, you know, nonprofit organizations and they're all looking for ways to raise money, but I'm very much in favor of, you know, looking at at least no, no more of a cost increase to the taxpayers and looking for the oil some ways internally to meet your budget. Just my opinion. Yeah, and not, not to argue with you, Mike, but just to make sure, um, you know, I think Justin said that the, the program from soup to nuts, rent and everything else was, what was it, $220,000 or something like that, two twenty five. dollars So the 54000 that comes from, the, from these uh, towns. five towns is, is about 25% of the budget it's not it's not coming all from the taxpayers right and i'm um, looking at when and, i'm looking and, at the co the cost per meal seem to be uh, you know i'm not a food service person you know maybe mark being in the industry but you know for a meals on wheels program i'm curious how their cost per meal relates to other meals on wheels programs well, well, the cost per meal, though, that Justin showed, and Justin, correct me if I'm wrong, that was taking the, the total budget of 225000 and dividing that by the number of meals. Right. So it's, it's, it came out to whatever, $12 a meal. But if you look at the food budget and everything else, it's far less than that. Justin was just trying to give you an example that this is kind of the major mission that they have to do and it costs everything to do that, you know, salaries, rent, utilities. So the cost per meal isn't twelve dollars a meal. There's yeah, no way I'm, to spend and I'm not saying. I'm looking at the overall overall cost. Maybe there are some ways to bring food costs down as, well. but I think there's maybe some ways to bring down administrative costs. You know, but we, where, but we we are Michael. We're already doing doing things we feel we can at the moment. For instance, we've already um, cut what was our Comcast cable and internet set up. Right now, we don't need TV when, we, when, when seniors don't need to watch TV. So for instance, we've cut that back to internet only. So we are already looking at things we can do in that, in that realm, but you know, we've still got those big, those big chunks, we've got um, our three fantastic staff members and we've got heat, light, rent, insurance, all of those things that don't go away. Justin, you said there was an increase in Waterbury recipients for Meals on Wheels from 20, or at least over whatever period of time you were reviewing? Yes. What was that increase? Uh, it was from 55 I think the number is uh, yeah, fifty-five to sixty-six. Uh, specifically for Waterbury. In terms of Waterbury, 
I, I would have to go back and check my data on that. I don't have that at hand. I'm sorry. I mean, I, I think I'll take a different stance than, than Mike and I understand Mike's concerns. And of course, um, you know, it's never good to hear any business say they were not keeping track of their expenses to the point where potentially they have a big O that they didn't budget for. Um, I know labor is going up on a yearly basis. So I think for us to think as a town, if we're going to continue to support the senior center, which I hope we do, um, I think there's going to be an expectation that, you know, this cost could go up over time. And <clears throat> the hope would be that it keeps in line with grand list growth. And, you know, it's, uh, we continue to support an organization that ultimately is helping our seniors and feeding our seniors. Um, I appreciate that the focus is on the meals and we on wheels component. Um, I think it's a nice way for us to gauge how we try to budget Waterbury's assistance to the senior center. Um, a $2,500 increase for, for what I will say would be a single year. And then we review it and, and present a, something similar next year. And we check back in and, and see where you landed is where my, I, I would be. Um, I think it's reasonable, um, a reasonable ask. And I sympathize for your organization trying to figure this out. And I understand fundraising is extremely difficult um, during these times. I would definitely say the more, the better. I think there are a lot of people that are willing to give right now. It's just, you got to set up the opportunity to do it. So maybe some of it maybe isn't just as event-based as just giving people the idea and maybe talking to some of the local businesses, including mine, to see if we can assist in some of that public outreach. Um, but I, I would be of the favor, favor of changing the budget item to 12,500 and letting the town vote for the additional 20,000 as a special article. Katie, not do you have opinions? I'm kind of on the line. I, I'm seeing both of your perspectives. Just another question. Have you asked any of these other towns um, about their uh, stance on increases? Um, we are in the process uh, presenting the same numbers. Some towns have different processes to make the requests. Um, some say, for instance, you can't make a request unless you've got or a, an, an additional raised amount from last year, unless you have a certain number of signatures, things like that, that make life extra difficult at the moment. Um, we, we hope that some of the towns um, will look at this exact same data and see it uh, in the light that, yes, um, uh, that some of their costs have not gone up for years. And we hope that some of these small additions to their lines will be accepted. So last, uh, last kind of esoteric statistic for me, I, I didn't go all the way back to 2007 because I don't have it readily available, but I did go back to 2014. And in 2014, our town budget was $4 million at 4 million 23,385. And the $30,000 then divided into that was 0 0.00745. And last year, our budget was 5.5 .5 million. <clears throat> and when you divide that um, $30,000 into 5.5, .5, it's 0 0.00544. So if you multiply the 0 0.00745 that we were paying of the budget in 2014 times last year's budget, um, keeping everything equal, we would have been paying $41,000 a year ago. So my point is this has an increase from $30,000 since 2007 and uh, 2,500 on a $30,000 budget, you know, that's 8% in one year. But if you divide it by, you know, 14 years, it's it's less. It's not it's not even six tenths of one percent a year. And inflation has been, you know, 
running in the you know one and a half to two and a half percent range anyway. So um, I'm not trying to push the budget up, but this seems like a very modest request right now. And uh, we clearly have not kept anywhere close to the pace of inflation. Uh, this, this is Roger Tubby. Um, uh, just joined the board as a treasurer. And I, also as a CBCOA uh, data type person, the also to take into account is that the um, federal allocation for meals has not increased anywhere close to the amount that it costs to produce a meal. So the, the um, onus is on the local communities to pick up the charges. So, you know, just, just to take that back a little bit and say, you know, we, we appreciate whatever we can get from the local communities. Yeah, I, I, I would echo what Mark was saying about um, it being a rather modest increase. Um, and hearing all that data from Bill is, is very helpful. Um, I think that the community center provides a absolutely wonderful um, service to our community and to our absolutely most vulnerable citizens. Um, whose populace is growing every day, as the market told us. Um, I'd, be, I'd be in favor of this. And, you know, obviously we revisit in a year and, um, you know, maybe things, will, maybe things will change in a year. Maybe the federal government will step up and start paying more per meal. That would be lovely. It really would. <laughs> So we've taken 45 minutes on $2,500 and we've got about, you know, $8 million more to go, so. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, that's that's my feeling on this. $2,500, I mean, depending on the tax rate, 50 something thousand. I mean, we're talking about 70,000. 70, so, I mean, like to me, I feel like every year we have to build a fine $70,000, not $2,500. I, I do feel that Bill can find this in the budget. Um, without much pressure. So to me, um, the request is reasonable. And I personally would like now if if we do decide to vote, is this a vote bill? Or how do we approach this? I know no, it seems I, like I, maybe we have two of, of, of I three. I don't probably. think you need to, to vote. Um, I've heard, you know, if you want to vote, you can. But the, the ultimate vote will happen in a couple of weeks when we put everything together and you know we'll we obviously have to tell Justin and everybody else this is all subject to what you know if we get to the end and we're at a 55 cent tax rate and we really want to be at 51 well maybe we better take this out so for now what I heard you suggest Mark was uh $12,500 appropriation with the $20,000 special article. And if the rest of the board is willing, at least for tonight, to let that go forward and see what this ends up looking like with this in there, that's the way I would think. Um, Bill, on the special articles this year, within the process we're going to do, are they going to be line itemed or is it going to be all one chunk? I think we talked about it having it individual. I, I really, you know, one would be easiest and you know it's it's going to be counted by a, a voting machine so it's not like it's going to be uh you know people have to hand count these and lumping it all in as one really kind of gives people little opportunity to say no because they're saying no to everything so i i think it's going to be line item right Carla? i'd be a little more supportive of this and I would be supportive of the $2,500 with the caveat that they're that maybe give a message to the board of there has to be some more fiscal management. I'm really concerned about the missed payroll taxes. You know, that's $40,000 is a, is a big line item. So, you know, if, if there's some, you know, recognition that the board, you know, really needs to look at their financial stability 
you know, I'd be in favor of that increase. Yeah, and, and again, not to be the, um, the apologist for the senior center, but that all happened under the under watch of a different board and frankly, different executive directors and different employees. And I think part of the turnover that Katie talked about is just related to this kind of stuff, trying to get their house in order. Well, it sounds like we don't need to make it uh, a vote on it tonight. I, I would hope that the board would support uh, the increase within the budget, um, changing 10,000 to 12,500. But sounds like maybe Justin, there's a couple requests that Mike had that you could go get back to the board and uh, we'll continue to discuss it and um, look forward to our vote on the budget. And you, you'll, I'm sure Bill will be in touch with you. Absolutely. Thanks again for the opportunity and I'll sign off and let you get to the big money thing. Now. Nathan, uh, Justin? Thank you, Justin. Uh, hey, hold on, Carla. Quick got question for Justin. I'll be, I guess I'll be looking for a report to include in our annual report, probably from Vicki. Yes, I'll make sure okay. that happens for you. Hopefully within the next couple of weeks. Perfect. Thanks. Justin, you're going to take your stuff off our screen? <laughs> You don't want to keep it there? Okay. And, and cue the cat again. Are you on the cat butt back again? Okay. <laughs> Thank you for a good uh, presentation, Justin. Thanks again, and I'll leave you in peace. I'll sign off. Thank you. Thanks again. Thanks. Um, all right, moving on to manager's item. Uh, thanks to everyone for their patience. Fire department budget. Uh, Gary, okay. us. So uh, Gary's here, you can see his face. I'm gonna put the fire budget up. I'm gonna share my screen and uh, let Gary talk. And my guess is Gary doesn't have to talk as long as the senior citizens do. So Gary, go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, I, I made a few minor changes to this. I think I included them in the notes when I sent it to you the other day. We don't hear you, Gary. It's that mute button, sorry. There we go. <laughs> um, so there were things that we cut back on at, at Bill's request this past year. Um, quite honestly, they were, because it was such a difficult year, it was fairly easy to do. Um, we essentially eliminated our, our training budget because we really couldn't do much for, um, outside training, bring people in, send people places. Uh, the, our training, uh, a lot of it was done remotely. Um, either we'd send people, uh, you know, videos that they needed to watch and get back to us to ensure that they were getting some training. Um, we had people do um, you know, pre-plans, pre-incident plans at different buildings or around the town. So we were able to do it, but that also saved us some money. Um, and in this year's budget, the only big thing, and, and Bill made a, a recommendation on the um, building maintenance um, line item um, that I can talk about in just a moment. The only things that really went up in our budget that we have any control over is our new equipment, which went up, uh, $1,400 uh, out of that now it's going to be 77,400 if it's approved as it is. Um, and communications and that went up 500. And that I, I foresee uh, becoming more problematic over the years. We've been using a portable radio that we have enjoyed. Um, it's been a relatively inexpensive portable radio, but they're not making it. And we've had to actually uh, our radio vendors kind of shopped around to find the last ones that he could get. So we have to switch brands and, you know, we, we're just not getting the, uh, the cheaper radios any longer. So getting two portables this coming year is going to be a little over $3,000, which we can absorb in this. I just got the uh, quote from the vendor. They're expensive. Um, but when we have 40 plus portable radios, um, you know, some of them are 10, 15 years old, they start dying off. So, but we're also trying to understand that 
you know, there's not a bottomless pit of money. We, we get that. Um, that's why you won't see um, any large increases from us. The biggest increase, as I indicated, is building maintenance and the Maple Street station, the design of that station, uh, the outside is, and Nat, you certainly will have the correct terminology. I would not. Um, it's that kind of um, cement board or for lack of a better phrase, I guess. Yeah, that's it. Um, so every every few years, you know, that stuff starts flaking out of the grooves and it hasn't been done for more than a few years. And it's really coming apart. We've got a local um, contractor that is willing to do it. He gave us the price on it, which was actually better than um, what one of our firefighters thought it might be. Yeah, but he talked to him and he said he's he's doing everything that needs to be done. All those little grooves need to be picked out that are falling out, reseal all those um, gaps in between the boards and then repaint the entire building. Um, so that's really uh, the, the budget that I have for you. It's, it's pretty much, uh, there's even a couple minor drops, but overall it's pretty much level funding from last year. Here, here, can, you remind me, um, can you remind me, do you have a, is call volume pick up in the winter and have you maybe experienced the decrease in volume calls due to more people being in their homes may, or is that increase when people are in their homes? What have you seen for call volume and expectations through the winter? So the winter really, the only big impact is cars that fall off the road, um, crashes. Um, a lot of them, and we have really cut back on how quickly we respond on the interstate when the report is that a car went into the median. If there's a trooper around, we hold at the station um, until a trooper gets on scene, if they're relatively close. If they're, you know, down close to the, the, the line south on 89, um, you know, they, they could be 30, 40 minutes, so we'll, we'll respond. Uh, we're not big on going on the interstate. We're not big on going to any real calls, but we're not big on going to the interstate if we can avoid it. Um, we have crashed two trucks a number of years ago. Bill certainly mm -hmm. likely remembers that, and that those crashes were within a couple of weeks of each other. Um, nobody got hurt, but when when you go around to circles in a fire engine and hit the Jersey barrier, um, you know it, it's it's um, it's jarring, and especially when you're only going 10 or 15 miles an hour, and then the next truck got crashed by a tractor trailer that was going too fast, lost control, and almost hit one of our members, but hit the truck first. The way we um, set up at crash scene, so. The call volume this past year has dropped slightly, but it, it has dropped. It's picked back up at the it picked back up at the end of the calendar year, but it was really low throughout the the bigger part of the pandemic. People were reluctant to call us, um, and that was the same for most other departments around us and in the mutual aid system. Uh, people's call volumes dropped. Uh, stoves dropped and then it picked back up and they're on a, a, a record breaking year. Uh, we are not, we're, we're still gonna be down our call volume from the previous year, which has been a trend for the last three or four years. Right. Don't have you, a can see, you can see that in the, in the pay line, the regular pay line, uh, part time pay line is down. Uh, Gary, do you have much problem with uh, chimney fires anymore. I know back when I first came here, there was a chimney fire like every two weeks, but. Uh... There was. Uh, one of the things that we used to have a chimney fire, it seemed like you're right, Bill, every week or two. Um, so we made a big push to go out and we clean chimneys. Uh, we do that in the fall. Um, we do it by donation, but it's really, the, the donation is not the issue. The issue is getting people's chimneys cleaned. And we have had two, uh, actually one of them really wasn't a chimney fire, it was a, a plug stove. But So we've gone to two of that type of call so far this year. And we don't go much more than half a dozen in a year anymore. So the, being proactive and going out and cleaning people's chimneys, we do it on uh, training nights or 
uh, other special uh, chimney cleaning nights, it, it saves us from going out at three in the morning. Uh, or after somebody didn't want to call us because they thought they could handle it and then they've got a fire in a wall. So yeah. the chimney fires is really under control and that's not one of our big numbers. Um, a lot of it is um, smoke detectors or carbon monoxide detectors and you know crashes are what people perceive to be a crash. Yeah. Um, Duxbury's meeting tonight, uh, they're considering the fire contract that you approved back in December in the $115,000 range. So remember that that comes off the top in terms of what our uh, tax requirement is. I went over there a year ago and, you know, they had some of the standard questions, you know, why can't you just charge us per call? And well, we all know why that doesn't work. But their, their bigger, their, the question that they kind of pushed back on more than anything uh, for my answer was dispatching. And there's no question that, you know, $85,000 a year is a lot of money uh, to be spent. But when you think that we get 24, 7, 365 days a year for that, um, if we had to do that ourselves, it would be well over $200,000 just for the dispatching itself. So that's a pretty big increase, but remember there's a $2,500 um, payment in there. I can't exactly remember what that was for, Jerry, but we talked oh. about it a couple of months ago. So rather, yeah, it's, it's to upgrade the all of Capital Fire, which is what we're part of, oh. the, the radio system. So when if we get a call the entire mutual aid system will hear that but we can also communicate better and rather than everybody getting one lump sum bill which would be thousands um this seemed to be a more feasible option is pay it over 10 years right so it's 2500 dollars a year and there's dispatching included in that and then there's a couple of supplemental things to like a $1,500 charge every year, $1,700 charge, that's for some of the equipment, I think, so. And we're also paying for the ambulance portion of that as well. It's still a deal, yeah. We do pay for all of the ambulance portion of dispatching through this. And just as Gary said, uh, I wanna make sure everybody understands, at the very bottom, the two capital fund, uh, 172 is what we paid last year. Uh, I bumped it up right now by $20,000, and uh, the siding that Gary was talking about was a $5,000 expense, and he had it up here in the building maintenance line. Um, we really haven't set any money aside. We have this fire station CIP that we used to send money there and then pay the debt service out of that. And I put it back, I put the debt service back in the fire budget just so it was easier for Duxbury to see. So they would make sure that they understood that they were paying part of that. And we understand that. But um, I did some work a year ago and I said, well, even if we were putting $3,000 a year aside uh, since the building was built for future maintenance, you know, we'd have about $27,000 in there now if we had started that when the building was first open. So with this $20,000 going over this year, if we spend five, that'll be 15. And then we can catch up. I I'm hoping that, you know, by the end of like 2022, we'll have 30, 25, 30,000 in the reserve fund for the building, both the Main Street and the Maple Street Station. And, uh, you know, it's hard to believe, but they're uh, 10 years old this year, right? We opened them We opened them a month before the flood, or the Main Street Station anyway, was opened a month before the flood in uh, July of 2011. Yeah, and, and the stations certainly have served us well. They've been fairly low maintenance. We've got Honeywell that's now on contract um, that has done a, you know, it's done a really good job. There, there's a there's a contract price, yes, but we also all the filters get changed, all the carbon monoxide and the fuel, diesel exhaust filters get changed out on a 
on a regular basis, more regular basis than what we were able to do it. Um, we used to have to hunt them down. And then, you know, it's getting members to do all this stuff. So they take care of that. I've got a person that has taken on a couple other little roles on the department as something extra, you know, light bulbs. There's a, tr there's a tremendous amount of light bulbs. It seems crazy, but these bulbs have to be replaced. And so, you know, the, the buildings have served us well. I am absolutely confident if the Main Street station had not been replaced, we'd have had to figure out what to do because the old building certainly would have come down. So they've served us very well and we're very happy with them. Good. So I think that's it. Everybody okay with the fire budget as uh, as it looks? And uh, I didn't even look at the schedule, Gary. I assume after, um, you know, a million dollars worth of pumpers in the past uh, two years, we don't need any equipment this year. <laughs> I would not dare. <laughs> Come to the board and ask for a new truck. Uh, there, there is a you know, there's plans down the road. Obviously, um, well, we're putting money aside. We, yeah, we it, we've got the money, but nothing this year, right? N n absolutely nothing this year. Uh, no. Okay. Thank you, Gary, for not making that request. <laughs> <laughs> I, I somebody asked if on the department if we're looking at it, and I said. I, I, I don't think the plan is, and I certainly wouldn't do it and not still be the fire chief because I, I just didn't want to make that trip. Gary, do you get a cut on plumbing and heating for those uh, two facilities? <laughs> you would think, uh, but no, no, I, nothing for me. I, I, I am overpaid as a department head as it is. You don't want to tell us that during budget season. <laughs> 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 Take a look and see how much you're paying me. All right. Thanks, Gary. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Gary. Thank Phil, you. I, Phil, I know it's a real minor thing, but I was just scratching my head. Why is the public works director in the fire department budget? Just well, if you look at all the budgets, Mike, you'll see the public works director is in a lot of different places. I know. I'm so watching. the public works director is uh, the costs. So Bill Woodruff is the public works director and Alec Tuscany is the municipal engineer. They're both water department employees, but they do work for both EFUD and they do work for basically every department that, that we have. So what, what they do is uh, every year they put together a list. You can't really read it, but it looks like this. And um, they, they keep track of what they've done on a week by week basis. So um, I take their total cost, their pay and their benefits for both of them. And then I look at, okay, they work this many hours in the, in the highway department. So of, of Alex uh, pay, you know, $6,845 last year was, for the highway department. And uh, it was actually, Alec worked $70 worth for the fire department and Bill Woodruff had 895 hours worth. So basically that line item, Mike, is used to pay the EFUD water department because that they're carrying the full cost of it. So that's what it is. Gotcha. Thanks. Sure. Any other questions? All right, we can move on. Uh, oh, yeah. Find my agenda. CIP budget. CIP paving infrastructure, highway vehicles. Yep. Um, Bill Woodruff still on? Yep. Yes, I am. Okay, good. So I I sent this out yesterday afternoon and then I sent uh, an amended one out <clears throat> later today. <clears throat> and um, in the narrative that I sent uh, yesterday, when we were talking about the paving budget, the first thing I said was, uh, 
before we agree to spend, you know, over eight hundred thousand dollars, which would include this fifty six hundred dollars worth of debt, um, so it was well over seven hundred forty thousand dollars worth of paving. I wanted to make sure we had staff capacity to do it. I met with Gillian Gill this afternoon and uh, or this morning, and and we we don't. Um, so these two columns, <clears throat> you can see at the right here, it says proposed 21, and then it says proposed with no grant. <clears throat> the state provides- um, Bill, do you want to uh, share again? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't do that. Hang on. Uh, let me get out of here. All right, I think I just closed it down when I did that. So let me get it back up here again. I'm sorry. All right, let me try this again. Screen share. There we go. All right. So you see these two columns, proposed 21 and then proposed with no grant. Uh, the state provides a class two paving grant. Um, I think it's an 80-20 split. Um, and I thought that 200 was the max, but what he told me this morning that 175 is the maximum grant. So this budget shows us receiving a grant from the state, $475,000 towards this $305,000 paving project. This would be Stowe Street. Um, we need to do Stowe Street from Main Street to the Dry Bridge. Um, and that is our first priority. It's, it's kind of part of the Main Street project, except it's not fully incorporated into the Main Street project. So um, they've done lighting, they've done sidewalk work, but we need to do the street. And it's really imperative to get that done. But this 305 would take care of Stone Street from Main Street all the way up to Lincoln Street. And if we get this $175,000 grant, we would do Stowe Street. And then this um, 175 here would be a couple of other streets that um, that we would um, look at. And I didn't put up Bill's um, other memo here. So um, if we don't get the grant, and we, we probably won't know about the grant until May at the earliest, um, this 175, what did I say this was going to be Bill? North Street or um, we, we, would, we would do some, some of North Street, or all of North Street, I should say, Swayze Court. Raising court, and, and then seventy five thousand dollars just for other things that we might need a little cleanup on. So that that was that. So Stowe Street, North Street, and Swayze Court—they're basically all in the same place. Swayze Court's right opposite the school. North Street's the little half moon street up at the top of uh, Stowe Street, just before you get to Lincoln Street. So that would be uh, in that one seventy five. If we don't get the grant, then we would do the $90,000 here for Stowe Street from the Dry Bridge to Main Street. And then this 430 would basically be um, North Street and Blush Hill and Lonesome Trail. So that's really what the proposal is. And you can see when we entered this year, um, you know, we had a negative fund balance of 
street, $232,000. Uh, that was what we were thinking that we were gonna end the year with. We really ended it a little bit better off, negative 202. Um, if we get the grant and do this, this will be almost, you know, uh, evenly funded for the fund balance at the end of the year. If we don't get the grant, will be a similar fund balance as we went into this year. But remember, just so you don't get too freaked out about a $200,000 deficit, what we really consider is down here, this consolidated balance for the CIP. Um, this is, I should say, a little higher. It's, uh, Consolidated balances for the CIP were right here. Um, and we expected, we, end, we actually ended the year with a consolidated fund balance of 375. That's because we did that, that borrowing. Uh, so we were, were in much better shape. Uh, so if we get the paving grant and we do everything else in these CIPs, we'll have about $415,000 in our CIP. If we don't get the paving grant, we'll still end the year with about 200,000. So the, the loan that we've taken puts ourselves in a much better position. Um, any questions about paving? Okay. Uh, infrastructure, that's the next one here. Um, this, this number here is what we've spent this year on the Main Street project. Um, this number will go down before we put this budget to bed because when the water department and the sewer department from EFUD pay their share, it will go against this expense. So what happens when VTrans pays Jay McDonald and then VTrans sends Waterbury a bill for 2% of the costs for the eligible costs and that's what that 181 represents. There's a little bit of ineligible costs in there but essentially that's Waterbury's 2% share of the total Main Street project but some of that 2% share is going into the ground and water and sewer mains and rather than EFUD pay the state directly, the town pays um, VTRANS directly and then EFUD reimburses the town. So this number will go down. Uh, this number here for 2021, I'm carrying right now the same number that I've set for this year, but um, I think I heard Bob Farr today say that there's only about $2 million of Main Street construction left to go as far as the eligible costs. And if that's the case, 2% of $2 million is about 40,000. So when we get to the end of the budget process, this number will probably be a little bit lower than it is right now. As I said, it does include some, uh, there are some expenses related to Main Street that are not eligible. And we have to pay the full freight on those things. So, so the 160 is probably high, but it likely won't go down as low as 40 either. Um, Bill, you want to talk about the sidewalks that we've talked about, uh, a couple of different ones there, and then the bridge stuff. I think you've got that information handy. Okay, so um, a couple of the sidewalks that we had planned on replacing this year. Um, the senior center side of Stowe Street. Um, we replaced the water main on Stowe Street, lower Stowe Street last year. Last season, the plan is to do the sewer on Stowe Street this season. Along with that is the money Bill said we would spend for paving and rebuilding a little bit of that road. Um, so the sidewalks on the senior center side, we would hope to be able to do those this season. Uh, that would include granite curbing um, and new concrete sidewalks extending from the dry bridge down to Main Street. 
Um, and, and Bill, the, um, the sidewalks on the Casey Bagel side of the street, WBV side, that was paid for by the Main Street Project? That's correct. They originally, the conduit going through there, they agreed to pay the concrete sidewalk costs for in front of DEV and Casey's Bagels. They also agreed after a little push to add the granite curbing on that side. Uh, so we got the granite curbing kind of thrown in as a bonus on that side. Um, so we're going to try to duplicate that work over on the on the senior center side. Uh, so all of Lower Stowe Street would essentially look like Main Street um, when we're done the season, this coming construction season. Um, also on the sidewalk side, we have a plan to do about 700 feet of sidewalk on Winiski Street. Um, we, did, we did the other side oh, a couple years ago now. Um, this would be replacing the four foot sidewalk on Winiski Street with five foot sidewalk extending from the Main Street project down to about the cemetery. Um, so those are the two big sidewalk improvements we have planned for this season. Would you okay. like to go, go ahead, Bill. I was just gonna say on the, on the bridges. Yep. All right, so the bridge projects we have proposed for this year, um, during last year in the summertime, we've noticed on the dry bridge on Stowe Street, um, there were some odd shaped potholes um, that had developed in the travel portion, mainly in the lane uh, heading northbound, but some in the southbound lane as well. After uh, some investigation by some Stantec engineers and bridge experts, uh, we removed some of the asphalt on the bridge deck uh, got a look at the membrane, which is under the asphalt that covers and protects the concrete bridge deck, um, and determined probably a good course of action on that bridge would be to remove the asphalt, remove the membrane that's on there, and reapply a membrane and asphalt on the bridge deck itself, as well as the approach slabs uh, for a portion of those. Um, you know, the bridge is built in 205, 206, somewhere in that range. It's, it's a little early to do some of that work, but if we do it now, you know, the concrete and the rebar and everything in the bridge is still structurally sound. And applying that membrane back in a good layer of asphalt on it will really help protect the whole deck. Um, so that's a big bridge item we have. We also have a little bit of bridge work planned for Gupper Road, what we call, uh, I think it's bridge number three which is uh, right by Chris Vienzi's house. <clears throat> that bridge needs a little bit of concrete repair work done on the upper fascia beam. Um, somewhere down the line, it will need some, the asphalt to be milled off the deck and some guardrail work. But uh, we really like to just tackle the fascia beam repair right now um, and probably save the remainder of that bridge work to happen in advance of a couple road resurfacing. So we're kind of at the same level there when we come up through. Um, those are the big bridge ones we have planned right now. There's a couple others that could go, um, but I think those are the urgent needs. The dry bridge is really the most critical. Yeah, we really have to do that. Um, I think in terms of uh, Woody has, uh, Alec uh, do a lot of the bridge inventorying work and working with the inspectors and the like. And the, the, the bridge at Dr. Murray's is really kind of more critical than the one uh, over by the ends between the ends and the Zen barn. But um, because of, uh, you know, needing to do the dry bridge and, and really needing to concentrate on finishing up in the downtown so we don't have to come back into the downtown anytime soon. Um, that bridge at Dr. Murray's is just too expensive to fit into the program this year. So we'll have to come back there. Uh, the culvert improvements, um, we talked about, you know, one of the potential paving projects was Blush Hill Road. And that would be from <clears throat> uh, just above, the, almost up to crossroads. The Blush Hill is a class two road from Route 100 
up to not quite the WDEV powers, and we retained that uh, several years ago now, but that's pretty good shape. But from that point up, it's a class C road and it's really in rough shape. Um, this $12,000 will replace culverts, uh, you know, 18 inch culverts, two foot culverts, all on uh, Shuffle and on uh, Blush Hill from that point up to the up to the top and then on Lonesome Trail. We will do this culvert work, whether we do paving on Blush Hill or not, we'll get it done this year. If we, if we don't do Blush Hill this year because we get the grant, at least the culverts there will be done and ready to go. Um, just on Blush Hill, uh, what you wanted to explain probably what we're gonna to have to do over near Wendell Lowe's house uh, with that culvert, just in case we have to do that project so the board knows. Yep, so, so in advance of almost all of our paving projects, we take a look at the infrastructure that lies beneath the road, all the culverts. As Bill mentioned, that 12,000 will cover a lot of the small diameter culverts on Lonesome Trail and Blush Hill Road. But as you work further up past Lonesome Trail on Blush Hill Road, in the dip of the road there, there's a 36 inch culvert that picks up a stream right there um, that's in rough shape. And Per, our, per the codes and standards that we sign off on every year um, with VTRAN, any culvert that's 36 inch diameter or larger, when you're replacing it, um, best practices is to conduct a hydraulic study of the drainage area to determine if that 36 inch culvert or whatever is in, under the road is adequately sized. Um, we've done this on Hubbard Farm Road and Perry Hill Road and some other areas on some large diameter culverts. So that culvert in question right there is awaiting a hydraulic sizing study from the state of Vermont. They will most likely tell us that that 36 inch culvert is not adequate to cover the flow that comes down through there. Um, and so what normally happens in a case like that we will take whatever size they tell us we need to put in, whether it's a squash pipe, you know, four foot by seven foot or what have you. Um, but it's a little bit more of a job than what our folks can handle. Usually requires a little bit of engineering, um, some head wall work, et cetera. So should we go on the path of paving Blush Hill this season, uh, we may choose to stop short of that culvert location. Um, and either stop short of it and pick back up beyond it and with the paving or what have you, because we're under the assumption that we probably would not be ready to have that installed or even paid for if it was going to be a yeah. culvert job. So, and, and also one of the um, tangents as far as that hydraulic study is that you end up with those kind of projects needing a stream alteration permit. And um, the wildlife is much more uh, in, the, in the focus of, of the regulators now. So um, these projects can, can become pretty expensive because uh, they don't, you know, Mike, you'll understand, they don't want, uh, they don't want culverts that, you know, are, are elevated three or four feet above the stream bed because no, uh, you know, the, the aquatic uh, wildlife can't go through that culvert. So uh, when we did this project on, on Hubbard Farm Road, like Bill suggested, you know, what's, what size was that pipe, Bill? And then we had to fill it, allow it to get filled with gravel, right? Yeah, so what normally happens is when they give you the size of the pipe you want, let's say it's, uh, uh, they say the stream needs a six foot diameter culvert, um, what you do is you put the six foot diameter culvert in and then immediately fill two and a half to three feet at the bottom of the culvert with stone and gravel stream bed material, um, which somewhat obviously limits the carrying capacity of the culvert. But that is done for the aquatic or aquatic organism passage and et cetera. Um, so it's a little counterintuitive. They tell you you need a much larger pipe it's costing much more. You do that, then you immediately fill about a third of it in but that's the world we're in now. So anyway, the bottom line is um, 
there's no way we're going to have the information this year to even know what we need to do, never mind uh, being able to, to actually do the work. So uh, we won't be paving that culvert this year. If we do, well, if we do brush hill, we'll decide later on whether we, you know, do the whole hill, the whole road all the way up to the gravel and then come back next year or the year after and, and do a 200 foot section where the pipe is, or if we just go up to the pipe. But anyway, we just wanted to make sure that you're aware of that. Um, the building improvements here in this CIP, uh, you see we had $46,000 last year. Um, the 8,400 that we spent last year was for a lift in the uh, highway garage, uh, you know, a mechanical a lift so the mechanic could work on vehicles. Uh, the remaining money was supposed to do uh, some roof patching and then some siding work on the greater barn, I believe, Phil. And uh, since we already have done the, um, the lift, I just put 45 in there and hopefully that will take care of what we need to do on those two, those two highway buildings. See, did I get that right, Phil? Am I remembering correctly? Yep, yep, that's correct. Okay. Um, and then, uh, so any other questions on, on infrastructure? Bill, just a quick question. Um, you mentioned in the, on the main street project that $160,000 may get reduced because of the size of the contract. And you said, if there are some outside projects, we would have to fund them. What would those be? Uh, Bill probably knows better than I, but there are things like, uh, they call them wayfinding, um, wayfinding projects. So kiosks that are put up to, to help people figure out where they are. You know, there might be some historical interpretation on them. Um, kind of like the byway. Some of the, some of the things like the banner poles and planters and things like that. Um, benches, anything else, Bill, that I'm missing that were the non-participating? No, on, on the highway side, that's, that's most of the non-participating stuff. Um, really a small, small percentage yeah. of overall. Yeah, so I think that 160, if, did I hear Bob right, Bill, that she said about 2 million she thought was left for the project? Yeah, we, we the total projects it's been, it's spent so far over 19 million and it's a 21 million dollar project so okay yeah. so if there's uh if there's two million left two percent of that is forty thousand. the water and sewer will have a small percentage of that the water and sewer is all done now the only thing they'll be paying going forward is their kind of share of the administration and the share of you know i made bill at the beginning of the project, do some calculations to say, you know, the highway shouldn't have to pay for an uh, eight foot deep excavation to get down to a water and sewer line. So some of the roadway work, uh, we factored the water and sewer in there. So they'll have some of it, but that 160, if there's only 2 million left, that's way too much for this year. So that's a good thing. Uh, and. Uh, hopefully, we'll have that adjusted by next week or two. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, highway vehicles. Uh, again, I'm glad Bill's here because he met with Celia and me this morning and uh, just kind of had to sometimes follow the bouncing ball. So, this tandem truck, uh, that's a, a double axle. Uh, truck that, you know, it's the biggest highway truck that we have. We, we uh, put it in the budget and agreed to go ahead and buy it in 2020. Um, we have paid 129,456 for the cabin chassis that has been delivered to Clark's Truck Center where we ordered it from. Uh, they had to pay for it, so we had to pay for it. Um, but the body and who does the body bill? It's Viking or what's I believe that's a Viking on that one, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, the the body and the snow fighting equipment, 
is all made in Canada. And because of COVID and shutting down of plants and difficulties with transportation, we don't have the tandem truck yet. So we're sitting here waiting for $25,000. Um, you know, that I can't remember what the truck, the total cost was, but this 148 was a net cost. That was what we were going to have to pay in cash plus the trade in of the vehicle that we had gets us a new truck. So we've paid 129,456. We've got somewhere between 20 and 25 thousand dollars more to pay this year. Um, and we'll have to trade the truck in. So far, Clark has said they'll honor the trade in price that they offered us when we signed the contract almost a year ago. Well, actually, it was more than a year ago now, December of 19, we signed the contract. Um, hopefully, something shakes loose and we get the truck sooner rather than later. So that's what this $25,000 is for. Um, we need to replace one of the lawn mowers. We've got two gravely mowers that we mow the rec fields and the cemeteries with. Uh, I think, you know, they're on, on kind of a three year cycle. So we didn't have to buy anything for a mower last year. We've got one this year. We probably will have one next year and then get a year off. Um, and then the hydro cedar and trailer. Um, again, I'm gonna turn this over to Bill uh, I know what it is. I think we want it because of the general permit and uh, all of the higher regulation that we have from the state with regard to stormwater, but is that right? That's correct. Um, what the municipal road general permit says nowadays is any ditch work we, that we do, um, really we should not be leaving any exposed soil after five days or something like that. So. Essentially, they want to see growth back in the ditches and on the banks um, almost immediately. Um, and some of the slopes that we have for ditch work and it's difficult to get grass growing on those. A hydro seeder um, with the right tack and the right uh, seed mixtures, et cetera, you can really get some good growth growing in less than 10 days. Um, it really is supposed to do the job on preventing sediment in your ditches and what have you. Um, so I think it's a it, it, it'd be a huge addition uh, and really something nowadays we need. Um, and you know it's it's twenty thousand dollars and it's something that we don't have now. There's always a little bit of maintenance. Um, I think it probably will last ten years anyway. So you know it's not a huge expense over time, but the first time you buy it. But I think um, these regulations with regard to uh, this general permit and stormwater uh, management overall is getting more and more stringent every year. Uh, we have a whole map now that shows us what they call hydrologically connected roads or roads that are connected to hydrologically connected streams. Um, it's not 100% of our roads, but we have a fair amount of them that we have to take special precautions with. So that's what I guess it's all about there. Uh, and then, Bill and Bill, just just one question: um, Do we currently contract with anyone to provide hydro seeding service? We do not. Um, this past year, we did some work um, that would have benefited from a hydro seeder. I did receive a price from a contractor to come do that. Um, it was a little more than the budget could could hold for the work that we had. Um, but yeah, I did reach out to a couple of contractors who do that. I also looked in to see if there was a rental available. Um, there was not. Um, and so that's kind of what led us down this path. Remember the, you remember the contractor's price bill off the top of your head? Um, I don't, but I probably have an email on that my desk, so I might be able to find that. It was for the, we've done the Maple Street paving project. And as you can imagine, there's two or three feet of shoulder on each side that um, a lot of the homeowners kind of wanted to see some grass growth there. Um, and it was kind of late in the season and the way the season was going drought wise, it, if we had planted it any with conventional seed, I'm not so sure we would have got any growth. 
And let's see, the price to hydro seed up on Maple Street was almost five thousand dollars. That was so for about five thousand dollars for one one project. Yes. And you know, you can buy the unit for twenty thousand dollars and even if it lasts only uh, you know five years, it's it's four thousand dollars a year. So um <laughs> It seems like to me, if that's going to be a, if that's going to be a um, something that we're going to be held to as a standard, then you know that that's just another tool in the arsenal. Yep. Yeah. And those um, hydro seeders, I mean, uh, they with the right conditions, that stuff grows like crazy. Yeah. And then um, what Celia asked us if we would do. Is if you would give me the authority to go ahead and order a truck now that we will not be paying for in 2021, uh, and probably you know we'll be lucky the way things are going right now to get delivery by the start of the winter next year. Uh, and when I say next year, I mean you know um, not a, not not this Christmas the Christmas after, uh, um, uh, and it's not a huge expense, but um, it's probably with the trade and and everything else, it'll be less than a hundred thousand um, dollars. We did that a year ago when we when we ordered this tandem truck, and we had hoped by ordering it in December of nineteen that we would have it by October of. 20 and it's now January of 21 and we don't have it yet. So um, I'm asking if you would just allow us to order that truck now for delivery in 2022. Bill, what type of truck are you looking at? It's a, it's, um, it's a, not a tandem truck. Uh, One of those, the standard dump trucks that okay, uh, dump we have truck. right now. Not, not a pickup. No, no, no. Okay, I figured it was have to be more like a regular dump truck. Yeah, it will replace the truck that Randy Guyette is driving now, if you ever see that. So it's just one of our standard, standard dump trucks. Six Might wheels. get a little bit smaller model because it's for the village, but essentially the truck that we have now is what we're talking about replacing, but it's not a tandem. Bill, how did, uh, this is the other Bill Woodruff. How did the uh, roadside mower work out this year? Uh, I think it worked fabulous. Um, yeah, we were able to keep ahead of a lot of the invasive species, which we had difficult doing before. Um, not an issue with the machine itself. It ran flawlessly um, with the right operator in it. It did a great job. Um, I think it's, it's a huge addition to the fleet, really. Good. How many yeah. bottles did it hit? I, it made a mess of a few <laughs> things. Um, yeah, but not overall, not too bad. If they're not on Guptal, they're on Ripley. And if they're not on Ripley, they're everywhere else, I guess. Yeah, it does bring the garbage to the forefront. That's for sure. <laughs> and in, in 2022, we've got that truck that I just talked to you about. Uh, we're going to have to do something with the excavator that we currently have. And uh, it was supposed to be this loader up here for 150,000 was supposed to be next year. But given, you know, just trying to balance things out, it makes more sense to move this purchase of the loader up this year so we don't have a you know, a, a modest, a really low price this year, and then, you know, go up uh, exponentially next year and then back down. So I'd like to include this $150,000 loader um, here. And, uh, you know, this will be the probably the net price, uh, the prices of the loader. And I'm hoping that this is a, a conservatively high price that the, the price of the loaders are probably in the $180,000 range. Uh, I'm hoping that maybe we get a little bit more for the trade than this shows, but um, 
you know, I want to have enough money. So that's what the why the motor is on this year. What is the price of heavy equipment going this year with the pandemic? Is it higher? Well, I, you know, this is the last price that we've received, Mike. I, you know, Celia does most of that shopping, if you will, and talks with Bill about it. Um, we are concerned that, you know, certainly on the lumber side of the world, as Matt knows, uh, you know, there's huge price increases there. So uh, we just don't know yet. These, this is the best information we have at the moment. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, and then no fire vehicles uh, and I talked about this $20,000 going into the fire station CIP and this 5,000 being spent for the siding on the Maple Street station. We talked about the REC CIP. We got the check for $10,000 from um, Shaw's today. It was deposited in the bank, so that check came. And you know, here's the van that we're, I mean, the van down here that we're hoping to buy. So we talked about this last year. The last thing that I just want to mention to you, let me uh, get rid of this um, one. Hey, Woody, I'm all set if you want to get going. I don't think, unless the board has any other questions, I'm all set with you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, let me get one other CIP budget up here. Hang on. Okay, so let me go back to screen share. So this is this is what I sent you yesterday, I guess it was. And we don't have to make this decision now. Uh, Mark, you may remember this conversation back before we bought the fire truck. Matt, you were on the board then too, weren't you? Mm -hmm. So we we borrowed um, a month or so ago. We borrowed a one million three hundred sixty-six thousand dollars from the bank, and we're borrowing that right now. The note that you authorized me to sign, um, we're borrowing that at one and a half. 1.55% for five years. So we've got to pay this 136, 1,366,000 off in five years. And I think with interest, um, it's about $290,000 a year of debt service. And throughout this CIP, I have here, this is for the, um, Let's go up to infrastructure. So in the infrastructure fund of that 1.366 million, we posted 145,880 here. And this debt service of 41.7 and 27.50 for interest, this amount, 12,500, is what we're paying ourselves back. We have to raise it to 41,700 if we're going to pay the infrastructure share of that $1.3 million loan off at 145. Um, down here in the highway uh, fund, we posted 260,000 of that loan here. And in order to pay that 260,000 back in five years, Instead of something like this for debt service, and probably be in the thirty, thirty-five thousand dollar range, we're at you know about 
89,000 here. Down here in the fire department, where we posted 950,000, we're going to have to pay, you know, $230,000 of debt service as opposed to probably 75,000. So we don't have to decide today, but my recommendation to, to the select board is going to be uh, you should authorize me or, or you should approve what's called refunding a note. And Mike might know about this from his former work, but what the refunding legislation allows, the, the legislature has passed a law which allows select boards and city councils on their own motion to evaluate the debt service they have. And if they determine that it's in the best interest of the community to turn that note into a bond, you can do it. And you can bond out to 20 years. Now, some of these things, the fire truck certainly bonding, normally we bond for a fire truck for 20 years. Uh, for the roadside mower though, which is part of what we bought here in this tandem truck, uh, you know, that wouldn't be 20 years. It might be 10, maybe 15. Uh, the same thing up here for the CIP stuff, the Main Street project, certainly we could bond that out for 20 years. But what I'm thinking that we might be able to, uh, you know, do some kind of um, melding of philosophies. I know Chris isn't on the call tonight, but, you know, Chris likes to pay debt off as fast as we can. So rather than maybe refunding this note and turning it into a 20 year bond, we could turn it into a 15 year bond would have these fire trucks for 20 years. Uh, and, you know, it's pretty low interest, but um, still trying to pay $280,000 worth of uh, principal. And so that 1,366,880 that we borrowed, 1,366,880, six, if you simply divide that by five, it's about $273,000. If you take the 1366880 and spread it over 15 years, the principal payment drops to about $90,000. So I really think, not today, uh, we'll, we'll put the budget together with these numbers in it. This is the worst case scenario we'll have to make a decision about refunding in the, in the early spring sometime. Uh, but I think that's really the way to go. I don't think we should try to pay this off in five years. So with that, I'm done with the presentation tonight. And the last thing I said I'm done, but what I, I said in my email today so you can see the highway fund is planning to send $447,000 to the paving fund. The highway fund is planning to spend or send um, $252,000 into the infrastructure CIP. Uh, the highway fund is planning to send um, almost 150 into the uh, uh, the vehicle CIP. The fire department will be sending into the uh, fire department vehicle CIP 172,000 and then $20,000 down here. And then the rec department will be sending uh, 37,800. So if we get to do all this just as it is, we end up with this consolidated um, deal. Well, it's the other one because this one doesn't have the updated stuff on paving, but somewhere between 200 and $430,000 of a fund balance. If we cut back on this, uh, this principal payment, uh, that fund balance will be even that much higher. But if we have to uh, make cuts in our budget, 
to get our 51 cent tax rate, we've got a lot of transfers going into this fund that we could reduce and, and live with a little bit lower fund balances in the CIT fund. So I think that if we have to cut money right now in order to meet our 51 cent tax rate, I would cut these transfers because if we convert the note to a bond, that will give us a lot more cushion. Um, and I think that's the way I would handle it if we need to, if we need to uh, be drastic about getting down to that 51 cent. I agree with your analysis, Bill. We're, we're like minds. I think we're in such a good interest rate environment. It just makes sense. Anybody else? Terry, do you need to make a special meeting to come in and talk to me? Yeah, let's do that. And also, can you look over my financials as well, Bill? <laughs> sure. I'll do it for a fee. <laughs> Yeah, I guess, Bill, the one thing I and and maybe you alluded to it and I missed it, um, is just understanding what maybe we should be trying to project as a annual fund balance just to make sure that we're doing what, what they're ultimately supposed to do, which is making sure we're protecting ourselves against a large expense upcoming. Yeah. And if you have a feeling of where you'd like to see that balance on a yearly basis, and I don't know if it's a percentage of budget or, or what. Yeah, I... Let me think about that, Mark. It's a, that's a good question. I feel a lot better where we are now. You know, when I look back into the uh, last year's annual report and I looked at the consolidated balance, which doesn't show up, you know, we we uh, we budgeted to go into 2019. We were hoping to end with a thirty thousand dollar fund balance and. Uh, for a variety of reasons, we were underwater by about 260000 but that's because we bought a fire truck that we didn't think that we were going to have to buy that year, and we weren't able to fund it then. But um, that, that last spreadsheet that I had up that I'm not going to put up now, um, that you know, $200,000 to $400,000 range Without a lot of thought, the $200,000 uh, fund balance in the aggregate CITs uh, sounds like a pretty good place to, to be. So if we can if we can maintain that and still keep the 51 cent tax rate this year, I think that would be a real win. Okay, thank you. All right, um, is there anything else, sir? I think maybe we can. Uh, so there's, there's no uh, there's no motions that need to be made right now. Um, well, I guess I would like you to make the motion just to authorize me to order that that highway truck that we're not going to get until 2022. Could you make a motion just so that way if the truck dealer says, do you have the authority to do this, I can show them the minutes. I, I make a motion to approve the town manager uh, to order a dump truck uh, price to be determined uh, in fiscal year 2021. Who? 22. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. I think that's it for the agenda. Anything else or we can... Yep. So I, uh, I'm hopeful that when we meet next week on the 18th, that I'll have uh, a really good idea of how we ended 2020. Um, you know, we, we've got some bills to pay and we'll get some straggling revenue that will be posted back by the time we get that check from EFUD for their share of Main Street. So I'm hopeful that between knowing how 2020 ended and what we've talked about with all these budgets, we've really done everything except you folks talking about the library budget. Um, I had a meeting with them tonight and uh, you know, I'm finalizing the work with them. So I'm hopeful that at this time next week, 
we'll have a really good idea whether we just need to do a little bit of fine tuning on the 25th or if I have to really work hard between the 18th and the 25th to find, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to get us down to a 51 cent tax rate. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Okay. All right. I'll take Thank a motion to adjourn. And we'll see you around. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Okay. All right. Have a good night.